Welcome to lecture 7 of embedded systems which is about interrupts. In the computing terminology, the word interrupt literally means to interrupt the microprocessor. And that's because microprocessor is usually busy executing its main program until some peripheral or emergency need interrupts it, essentially asking it to pause its main program and instead runs, runs some other program. And once the program is complete, the microprocessor may be allowed to resume its main program. However, in a more technical terms, would define interrupt to be the automatic transfer of software execution in response to the hardware event, call it trigger. Uh, that is asynchronous with the current software execution. So the word asynchronous is quite important here. That is, the automatic transfer is not synchronized with the execution of the main program. It means that it can occur randomly with respect to the execution of the main program. Uh, or it can occur at any time uh, during the execution of the main program. So some examples include, the examples of interrupt include the interrupt generated by an external I.O. device like a keyboard or a printer. However, interrupt can also be generated as a result of an internal event like um, some opcode failure, opcode fault, or due to the periodic timer. That is when the timer has finished its countdown. The, the first round of countdown. So, interrupts are important and they uh, are defined to occur typically when the hardware needs uh, some service. And we're going to discuss that uh, in a bit more detail in the next few slides. The question is, what are different types of events which can trigger the interrupt. There can be many in general. However, we are going to list three of them over here. The first of them being those very important events that occur rather infrequently, such as the alarm condition or the power failure or the low battery message or some other error condition, such as the awkward fall, so in the previous slide. There can be other interrupt events uh, which are associated with the changes of signal on the input-output ports. And those interrupt events are important from the perspective of synchronizing the input-output operation, therefore the I.O. synchronization. And note that the first two types of events are primarily asynchronous. These are asynchronous events, meaning that they occur, they appear to occur randomly to the microprocessor main program. There are other type of interrupt events which occur more periodically. We call them the periodic interrupts. And the most common type would be the interrupt generated by the timer on the microcontroller, such as the cystic timer, as we studied previously. So there can be an interrupt generated by the cystic timer as soon as it has finished its countdown. And that's when we uh, respond to the interrupt by uh, modifying the read load value or uh, we can also think about um, uh, changing the interrupt rate etc. The next question is how the interrupts are actually handled in the hardware. So here we have a description of the hardware um, executing different programs Actually, there are two types of programs, one shown uh, with the help of the pink color uh, with the caption busy, uh, 
that corresponds to the main program and we call this the main thread. So the hardware which is the microprocessor is busy <clears throat> executing the main thread until there is some hardware module on the microcontroller chip uh, that seeks some service over here. So at that point, that hardware module is going to interrupt the microcontroller. So at this point, the interrupt is generated. So if the horizontal arrow corresponds to the arrow of time, then at this point, the interrupt has been generated. And uh, the microprocessor will then go on to execute the interrupt thread, temporarily suspending its main program. So this is going to be suspended for some time. The interrupt thread is executed as interrupt service routine, ISR. So remember, ISR is the interrupt service routine. This is the program that a microprocessor must execute when it acknowledges when it acknowledges the interrupt and when it has made all the preparation to suspend its main program, it, it then proceeds to execute the interrupt service routine. And once the interrupt service routine is completed, that's done, then the microprocessor is going to restore its execution status that was um, so that was saved when the main program was suspended. So the restoration of the main thread or the main program um, takes place and that, that, that therefore it restores the execution state and we're going to describe in more detail what we mean by the execution state. So after restoration it then continues to execute its main program. And this example over here it's an example of an interrupt service routine which uh, outputs a value to the digital to the analog converter uh, DAC, as we call it. Uh, the moment the cystic timer generates an interrupt, uh, and that interrupt would be generated, as we shall see in 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 in, in the future lecture, that once the timer has completed its countdown. So as soon as the timer generates an interrupt, the interrupt service routine is executed by the microprocessor in which uh, there is some value outputted to the digital to analog converter. So this is just one example of ISR. We're going to discuss quite a few of those um, uh, in the upcoming slides. Let us now try to understand how can a programmer configure the ARM Cortex M microcontroller board for the interrupts. The first thing to note is that there is an ARM bit for each source which can possibly interrupt the microprocessor. So we say that for each potential interrupt source has a separate ARM bit which can be set either to 1 or to 0. And if the ARM bit is set, then essentially we are allowing the corresponding device to be able to uh, interrupt the microcontroller to be able to uh, or, or we are asking microcontroller to take or accept interrupt from those devices for which we have set the arm bit equals to one. So that's what we mean by setting the arm bit. Uh, if however the arm bit is zero, that is it is cleared we are deactivating those devices ability to interrupt the microprocessor or we can say that the microprocessor will not uh, accept interrupt from those devices so the interrupts are disabled other than the arm bit there is a flag bit for each source so each source each, each potential interrupt source has a separate flag bit and it, it is important to correctly understand the functionality of this flag bit and how can a programmer well, and what a programmer needs to do in the software uh, 
to properly handle the interrupt and to be able to write the interrupt service routine. The first thing to note is that the flag bid is set by the hardware the moment the device requests an interrupt. So if the arm bit is enabled, uh, that, that is the first condition. So if the arm bit is set and the device can interrupt the microprocessor, then if the interrupt does occur, then there is a hardware support that the programmer does not need to care about as such. And the hardware is going to set the flag bit automatically. That is set equals to one. So the flag bit is set to one the moment interrupt is generated. Then comes the role of the programmer who is responsible to clear of clearing the flag bit in the interrupt service routine. So when the microprocessor execution is diverted to the interrupt service routine, as we saw in the previous slides, then inside the interrupt service routine, it is the job of a programmer to clear the flag. And that is an acknowledgement that the interrupt has been interrupt request has been processed. Um, uh, th that's when we clear the flag bit. So the flag bit is set to one by the hardware, but it is cleared in the software. That is when it is set equals to zero. And that's the job of a programmer. Remember that. So, so far we have talked about the interrupt configuration bits which are specific to the source or so the source specific whether we talk about the flag bit or the arm bit there is however another bit a single bit that is shared uh, sort of shared by all the interrupt sources um, called as the interrupt enable uh, to put it in simple words we say that this is a global on off switch of the interrupts so this is global on-off switch for the interrupt. So if a microprocessor is in no mood of accepting the interrupts, or we don't want our microprocessor to accept any of the interrupts, then we can just simply put this bit equals to zero. That is, we're going to disable the interrupts. And if this bit is set equals to one, then we are really uh, asking microprocessor to be able to so so we are we are forcing microprocessor to accept the interrupt if there is any device interrupt interest if there is a device seeking service through the interrupt this interrupt enable bit also mentioned as the capital i bit is in the prime masks register and uh, this is one of the uh, special function register inside the microprocessor uh, who's uh, is a 32 bit register, but the least significant bit is the interrupt enable bit. And we're going to indirectly set or reset this bit using a predefined routine. We're not going to uh, directly access or uh, directly enable or disable this. There's, there are There is a separate uh, method that we need to follow. And finally, each interrupt source has a priority level. And associated with that, we have a re register, base priority register inside the microprocessor. Uh, and we're going to discuss that in a bit more detail on the next slide. But here, the thing to note is that if the value of this register is zero, essentially it means that all interrupts can be serviced by the microprocessor and, there, and none of them is going to be postponed. So uh, if we just set this base uh, priority register base PRI register equals to zero it means that uh, essentially all the interrupts will treat e equal uh, will be treated as equal priority interrupt uh, but there is much more to this priority concept that uh, we are not going to describe in the next slide now we discuss the concept of the interrupt priority there is a three bit field to be explored later that sets the priority of each interrupt source separately. So with three bits, we can assign eight interrupt priority levels from zero to seven. And the most important thing to understand is that the lower value corresponds to the higher priority. 
for example, the priority value set to zero means the highest priority, and where, uh, whereas the priority value set to seven means the lowest priority. So this is the one thing, the most one of the most important things that you, you should always keep in mind that the priority uh, value is inversely proportional to the actual pr priority. But what is the significance of the intra priority? The significance lies in the situation that if there are multiple sources interrupting the microprocessor simultaneously, then the source whose or, or the device whose which has the higher pr priority means the lower priority value will be serviced first. And that with the lower priority will be momentarily suspended but will be executed uh, once the interrupt with the higher priority has, in, uh, it, it has been serviced by its corresponding interrupt service routine. And there are several scenarios in the ARM Cortex-M microcontroller boards wherein, uh, for example, uh, if we have multiple input channels um, sending data to the analog to digital converter. Now there is a single ADC, analog to digital converter, but there can be multiple input channels. So whose, whose channel input is going to be, uh, analog input will be digitized, depends, it, it can be set by adjusting the prior, priority of the input channels and we shall see that in the next lecture as well. Returning to the significance of the base priority register, let's take an example over here now that we understand the concept of intra-priority. If the base prior priority register has values equals to 3 or set equals to 3, it means that all interrupting devices with a priority value, now this is the priority value, not the actual priority. So the so all the devices with the priority value set less than three can interrupt microprocessor now at this point. And those devices whose priority level is set four or higher cannot interrupt the microprocessor. So this base PRI value really controls who is going, whose interrupt will be serviced at this point or whose service, whose interrupt is going to be postponed. And here I would like to give you a quick overview of some of the registers inside the microprocessor which are associated with the handling of interrupt. We have seen those general purpose registers R0 through R12 and possibly uh, the stack pointer was also used when we discussed the stack. The link register when we called routines in the program counter is always there pointing to the instruction uh, to be executed. But what we also have over here is a prime mass register, the base PRI register uh, th that we describe. Uh, the prime mass, prime mass register, remember the least significant bit is going to control the global on off button for the interrupts and the base PRI is going to set the interrupt, uh, will decide uh, which devices are going to, uh, go, uh, are allowed to interrupt the microprocessor depending upon their priority levels. There's also another register, these uh, that's called the program status register um, that uh, will be described uh, when we are going to discuss the concept of context switch and what is, what is the significance of PSR. PSR. Uh, but right now, um, over here, I would like to point out that the stack pointer, uh, SP, there are actually two stack pointers in the hardware, the program stack pointer and the main stack pointer. So unless we are going to, do, we are going to develop the embedded uh, operating systems on the uh, on our microcontroller, we are going to live with only one stack pointer, that is the main stack pointer. So, uh, as far as our discussion is concerned, whether, it, whether we talk about MSP or simple SP, they are just one and the same thing. Uh, but note that um, there are two stack pointers in the hardware, and they, and if we're developing, if if we are developing some embedded 
embedded operating system application then one of the stack pointers is used by the operating system and the other one is used by the user program under what conditions does a microprocessor accept the interrupt and execute the corresponding interrupt service routine it turns out that there is a set of minimal minimum conditions containing four conditions let's explore those the arm the, the source interested in requesting uh, in interrupting the microcontroller must have the arm bit set enable the enabled bit must be set that is um, and and this enable bit is set when i is equal to zero in the prime mass register so it, so it, it, this is a bit counterintuitive so the, the global interrupts are enabled when i bit is set equals to zero rather than one the interrupt level or the priority level of the device is less than the value in the base priority register and the fourth condition is that the trigger the it what this means is that the device has actually triggered an interrupt the device has actually generated an interrupt and that's that occurs uh, sort of um, and that is handled somewhat automatically there's a hardware which sets the corresponding flag there's a trigger flag that is set by the hardware the moment the device uh, requests an interrupt so this four condition if these four conditions are fulfilled it means that the microprocessor can now proceed to execute the interrupt service routine but one of the important things to note is that the interrupt can remain pending in a, in a pending state if the trigger is set but other conditions are not true so the, this again reinforces the fact that all these four conditions must be fulfilled uh, before the interrupt is serviced however interrupt can be serviced uh, once all the conditions are true uh, are fulfilled and once the interrupt is being serviced and as we said before that inside the interrupt service routine which is being executed there must be a provision of clearing the trigger flag uh, unless uh, uh, and if we don't do otherwise uh, we may run into a problem of getting an endless interrupts let me qu quickly go over the contents of the prime mass register and we said before that the least significant bit bit zero of this register must be set equals to one if we want to disable the activation of interrupts um, uh, the default value zero means that the interrupts are enabled uh, the upper 31 bits are reserved and these are sort of uh, opaque to the programmer and regarding the program status register from the programmers perspective we focus on figure 4 the first 9 bits bit number 0 to 8 carry the interrupt service routine number that we are going to discuss in a bit more detail shortly uh, and th there are uh, some reserve bits and uh, bits from some other purposes and the the code bits that we discussed in the beginning of this course the zero flag the overflow flag carry and so on those are also stored in the program status register but um, it also stores the interrupt service routine that is being currently executed by the microprocessor so that's one of the job of the program status register there can be as many as 50 different sources of interrupts and the program status register is going to register it is going to register or record the uh, interrupt source whose uh, service routine is currently under execution also it is important to understand how the interrupts are internally handled inside 
the microprocessor hardware. The first step is the suspension of the main program the microprocessor is currently executing. Once the main program is suspended, however, that does not mean then the ongoing instruction is suspended. In fact, the microprocessor proceeds with the execution of the current instruction till it is finished. So once the instruction is finished, then uh, the suspension task actually begins by pushing the eight registers R0 through R3. The, these are uh, the four registers R0 through R3, the register R12, a link register, program counter, and the program status registers all pushed onto the stack. And these eight registers really define the execution state. So these, these really define the state, the execution state of the main program or, 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 or for that matter, any program. So the state of the microprocessor is described by these eight registers. Um, then the link register is set to a specific value uh, that's hex uh, FF, 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 and the last byte uh, can be different here. It is shown as F9. It has a special meaning. The last byte has a special meaning. So F9 really means that the microprocessor was interrupted while executing the main program, and we're going to return to the main program. So we're going to return to the main program. And if there is a situation where there is one interrupt service routine, um, is being currently executed and then there comes a high priority interrupt then this value might be different and you can consult the textbook for more details but uh, in most situations this is going to be f9 then we're going to change the value of the program status register uh, the first nine bits are going to store the interrupt number so the microprocessor is going to recognize the device requesting the interrupt service and the, the corresponding interrupt service routine number is stored in the program status register. And then the program counter uh, is, uh, is now going to point to the interrupt service routine first instruction and then proceed therefrom. So this, these are the five steps which are uh, which take place the moment the microprocessor uh, acknowledges the interrupt and suspends its main program. Once the microprocessor begins, uh, it enters the interrupt service routine, begins executing its instruction, uh, the first step is the clearing the trigger flag. So yes, it is the same flag, the trigger flag must be cleared. Uh, then the next part is the main part, the main program, uh, the the essential part of the interrupt service routine. That's we're calling it the necessary operations, and uh, that may also include communicating with some global variables. So these are these all all of these uh, steps belong to the execution of interrupt service routine, uh, and then finally once the uh, upon the exit, when the uh, when the ISR is complete, the microprocessor now uh, intends to resume its main program. Then the final instruction of any interrupt service routine must be the BXLR. That is uh, very uh, the, and and we are familiar with this BXLR instruction. What it does is that it uh, brings the control back to the routine that uh, or the program that called the routine. In this case, we are going to go back to the main program. But here, while we are going to return to the main program, there we need to pull the eight registers from the stack as well. So along the way, we have to ensure that we pull those eight registers. What are those eight registers? These are R0 through R3, R12. LR, PC, and the program status register. So these are the eight registers which were pushed to the stack are now being popped off. 
We can also summarize all these steps pictorially. So the status of the microprocessor shown here before the interrupt. Uh, you can see the value stored in the interrupt registers uh, over here. So uh, these are all before the interrupt. And then we have a concept of a context switch. What do we mean by the context switch? Well, essentially, these are the five steps that we defined before. That is that we are going to finish the current instruction. We're going to push the registers and we're going to set the values of the program counter, the program status register and the link registers. So all of these steps constitute what we call as the context switch. And uh, MSP will be our stack pointer. And um, uh, then so once uh, that has been done, then note how the values of the microprocessor registers change. Uh, essentially, the program status, status register now contains 18, uh, signifying that uh, this corresponds to the interrupt generated by port C, that is the general purpose input output port C interrupt. And if it had been 15, it would, uh, it, it would correspond to the interrupt of cystic timer. Um, what about the value of PC? So that's hex for it. So remember, this is uh, essentially uh, a pointer. It, it is an address. So hex for it over here is a pointer, which is an address of the interrupt service routine of port C. So somewhere in your uh, uh, microprocessor ROM, uh, the, the, there is an interrupt service routine that can also be programmed by the user or the programmer uh, that's over there. So micro, the program counter is now pointing towards that address, which means that if this is uh, the microprocessor ROM, so somewhere over here, there's a portion uh, starting with hex 48. That's where the ISR of port C is located. So the program counter is now pointing over here and it will execute this ISR. And once the interrupt uh, service has been executed, then uh, as described in the previous slide, the con context switch will be reverted. Essentially, this context switch represents the context uh, of the program which was suspended. So these, this is going to be restored after the interrupt. So after ISR, this is going to be restored. So after ISR execution, we're going to restore the context switch and the program counter will resume uh, it will, will resume and will, uh, the microprocessor will resume the execution of the main program with program counter uh, pointing to the uh, next instruction to be executed in the main program and uh, PCR, PSR value and the link register values will be changed accordingly. So once again, a gentle reminder, you should always keep in mind about those four conditions, arm, enable, the priority level and the trigger that must be fulfilled for an interrupt to occur and to be serviced. Very important to become familiar with the interrupt vectors for a programmer who wants to program the microcontroller for the interrupts. And as I explained before, there are no less than 50 sources of interrupts. Uh, these are shown by the corresponding interrupt request number IRQ. And again, before I proceed, I apologize for a extremely small font size, but I, I hope that is okay as long as you can zoom it in um, or consult the corresponding table in the textbook. Anyway, so there is an interrupt request number, and if you add 16 to the interrupt request number, you have another number field that uh, we, we can we'll see if we need that later on. But the important thing over here is the vector address. So this is the address where the ISR is stored. So this is an address where the interrupt service routine is stored. So the first, so for example, if we look at the GPIO port A. Uh, 
address over here that is actually third row that's hex 40 it means that uh, GPIO port A interrupt with the and the name of that interrupt service routine is going to be GPIO port A handler interrupt service routine will be available at the address hex 40 that's where the program counter needs to go to execute the ISR so this is actually the name this column contains the name of interrupt service routine these are the addresses this the first column contains the addresses of ISR so we now we have a number uh, interrupt request number the name of the interrupt service routine uh, and uh, we know the address and what we also have is a provision to change the priority levels of the interrupt so we have three bits um, and those three bits for each source are contained in uh, in different registers so um, there the, the first two interrupt sources uh, uh, are uh, the priority levels of the first two interrupt sources are in the NVIC sys uh, PRI 3R registers and then we have um, the next quite a few actually uh, maybe next 36 uh, actually 38 39 so next 39 um, the the priority levels of the next 39 sources can be set uh, in the um, in the PRI starting from PRI 1011 so you can see these all these registers so pick up the choose your uh, interrupt service routine or the interrupt source and see which register does it correspond to uh, and that's where you go and set the priority bits so this table is important uh, from the perspective of programming or configuring the interrupts and also programming the microcontrollers for the interrupts speaking about setting the priority of the interrupt source we note that a single priority register such as NVIC priority register number zero uh, needs to be referenced for setting the priority levels of different interrupt sources such as uh, NVIC priority register number zero can be uh, holds the bits such as bit 5 through 7 for configuring the priority levels of GPIO port A and bit 29 to 31 to for the priority levels for GPIO port D and so on you can this way you can set the priority levels of all different sources of interrupts by referencing the proper NVIC priority register so keep that register in mind as well this is what we were talking about earlier that each uh, source has a separate uh, set of bits to set the corresponding priority levels and those are here uh, in the memory mapped NVIC priority registers so these NVIC priority registers offer uh, enable us to set uh, priority levels of each int interrupt source separately the nested vector interrupt controller that's the NVIC has what we call as yet another enable bit for each interrupting device so this is in addition to the device arm bit so remember in the arm bit we said that we uh, arm the device to be able to interrupt the microprocessor but there is yet another uh, enable bit that we need to set uh, for each device or each interrupting device and that is set inside the NVIC enable register there are two registers to note um, NVIC enable zero register and the NVIC enable one register so interrupt request uh, so the device with RERQ the interrupt request number from 0 to 31 so these are actually 32 bits so each bit of NVIC enable zero register corresponds to the enable bit this enable bit of 
the corresponding uh, interrupting device. So there, so this first register holds 32 enable bits. It holds 32 enable bits for interrupts, interrupt sources whose IRQ number starts from zero and ends at 31. So it has as many as 32 enable bits. And if we want to enable a particular source for the interrupt, then we set the corresponding bit to one. Likewise, the NVIC enable one register has 32 enable bits for the interrupt sources whose IQ, IRQ number starts from 32, goes up to 47. One exception for, to this enable bit rule is the cystic timer that we do not need to enable in the NVIC enable register. And as explained before, uh, we're going to write one to enable the corresponding interrupt source and zero means that uh, we're not going to uh, enable that. Uh, so, but this is very case specific. Um, and uh, in, in most cases, however, uh, it is important to write one to the corresponding bit in the NVIC enable register. So keep that register in mind uh, in, uh, when you are programming the interrupts. And once again, a gentle reminder, um, whenever we are writing the interrupt service routine, the first step to do is to acknowledge that the interrupt has occurred. And that is, uh, that is done by clearing the interrupt, uh, the, the trigger flag. Uh, then, uh, but however, in case of cystic timer interrupt, the interrupt occurs, the, uh, the acknowledgement occur, occurs automatically, which means that we don't have to clear the cystic trigger flag. It is automatically cleared in the ISR. Uh, and we're going to push R4 through R11. These are eight registers. Uh, that, those are going to be pushed on top of the stacks if we're going to use that in the ISR. So if, we, if, you, want, if you intend to use these registers in the ISR, then we're going to pu push them on, onto the stack and then uh, pop them when we are returning from the ISR. And um, uh, th that is fairly consistent with the ARM architectural procedure call standard because we're going to make this push and pop uh, as multiple of four. Uh, as we, we're, we are pushing and pops even number of uh, registers. And there might be some global variables that uh, we need some information passing. Let us now take a look at an explicit example of configuring interrupts. For example, by uh, looking at the interrupts of the GPIO port. Here I'm using this uh, postfix X. It can be either A, B, C, D, depending upon the IO port we are talking about. So these are the interrupts of GPIO port. X means it can be a, B, C, D, and so on, corresponding to the ports of the Cortex M4, Cortex M microcontroller boards that you are using. Um, the first one is the interrupt send. So for these, uh, for the configuration of the GPIO port interrupts, the first bit is the interrupt sense bit. The register is the interrupt sense register. GPIO port X interrupt sense register. Uh, again, we are going to configure the least significant eight bits because these correspond to the eight pins of the port, port X. And setting one means that the interrupt is going to be sensed on the level, either high or low. That will be decided later. But the, but, but really, Setting, setting the bit equals to one in the GPIO port X interrupt sensor register um, really says that we are going to sense the interrupt at the level, so the, the, uh, at the voltage level, high or low. Um, if 
however, if the bit is zero, then it means that the interrupt is sensed when there's a transition that is on the edge. When the voltage uh, is transitioned from high to low or low to high. The next register is the interrupt both edges register, IBE. So GPIO port X IBE register has uh, we are interested in configuring the least significant bits, least significant eight bits. One means the interrupt will be sensed on both edges where the voltage level is high or low the interrupt will be sensed zero means the interrupt will be sensed on a single edge or single level so let me say that again maybe i have made a mistake in the description so one means that the interrupt will be sensed on both edges or both levels because the port pin may be configured uh, to generate interrupt uh, either on the edge or on the level so here we are saying that the interrupt will be acknowledged whether there is um, um, uh, the interrupt is acknowledged on both edges high to low low to high and as well as on both levels if the pin is configured to sense interrupt to send interrupt on the levels and zero means interrupt is sensed uh, on a single edge or a single level and that then then we have to decide whether it is uh, if, 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 if it is configured to generate interrupt on the edge then either it is going to be low to high or high to low or if it is configured to send interrupt uh, at the level then will will it be high or will it be low but not both the interrupt event register GPIO port X IBE register again least significant 8 bits corresponding to the 8 pins of the port you set them to 1 it means that the interrupt is sensed on the rising edge or the level if we talk about if the pin is configured for the rising edge interrupt uh, for the edge interrupt then it is going to be the rising edge and if the pin is con configured for the level interrupt, level triggered interrupt, then the level, uh, it is going to be a high voltage level. Uh, if the corresponding bit is set equals to one, zero means low level, low voltage level, or the falling edge. Next comes the trigger flag for the GPIO port interrupt. Again, we have a register known as the row interrupt status RAS register. So GPIO port X RAS register, least significant eight bits. Now remember, because it is a trigger flag, it is set by the hardware. And that occurs if there is an interrupt. If there's a device connected to the port and the device generates an interrupt, either by setting the voltage to some voltage level or a transition of the voltage levels whatever way the pin is configured uh, then if the interrupt does occur then this bit is set equals to one so for example if we talk about gpio port d pin number let's say three then this bit is set equals to one if there is an interrupt let's say this is pd3 and if there is, let's say the pin number three of four D is configured for the rising edge interrupt. So as soon as there is a rising edge on PD three, then the hardware internally sets this uh, flag to one. But remember, this is sort of a read-only uh, thing, but we can directly reset it. We can indirectly reset it. However, that's done in the software. Let us see how can we do that. The trigger flag in the RIS register can be reset in the software by writing to the interrupt clear register. So now we have the corresponding clear uh, trigger clear register uh, that is GPIO port X IC. So that's interrupt clear. Least significant 8 bits, you write 1 
So in the previous example, if we want to acknowledge the interrupt on uh, PD3, right? So we write one to bit number three of the interrupt clear flag that uh, would acknowledge the interrupt essentially by clearing the corresponding bit. So when, when we write one, to the to this register at uh, bit number three when this so again if this bit is set equals to one then the bit number three of the ris register is cleared so this is how you indirectly clear the bits in the um, row interrupt service uh, that is the trigger flag register uh, so writing one clears the corresponding bit in the rs uh, RES register and finally we have the arm bit of the GPIO port interrupts that is the interrupt mask register GPIO port X IM register if we want to arm the port pin um, uh, so that it can interrupt the microprocessor we're going to set the corresponding bit equals to 1 let us now take a look at an example C code which configures the pin number 4 on port C for the falling edge interrupt. But our first task is to initialize the port. So we look at the port C, pin number 4 initialization. And uh, we're eventually going to write down an interrupt service routine that counts the number of times the falling edge is hit to port CP number four. So this is kind of a global variable we've been talking about earlier and has been declared the volatile, unsigned 32-bit uh, falling edge. Uh, it's a gl volatile global variable um, and it will be updated inside the interrupt service routine. Uh, so to be updated, this is going to be updated in the interrupt service routine. But first of all, we're gonna to have to look at the port initialization. So we have a routine, the edge counter initialization uh, that's input wide, output wide. Uh, so the first step is to activate the clock. We've seen that several times before. Uh, then we are going to set the direction of the port because it is going to uh, send the interrupt. So PC4 is an input pin. Uh, so one of the things to note about configuring the IO ports for the um, for the interrupts is that they can be configured for interrupts both as an input or the output pins. And the out uh, so it, it, intuitively it makes more sense uh, when it, uh, configuring the port pin as the input pin because it is going to sense it is going to sense some voltage level. Uh, either or, or some voltage edge or level whatever that is and that is going to send any uh, like is, depending upon what it sends uh, uh, you know the PC4 must be uh, because it is sensing some voltage level so it must be an input pin but remember it can also be an output pin when we, uh, we want to request microprocessor to send some signal uh, as an output to the pin so both are possible just that, just so you know in this case, however, this is uh, configured as the input pin uh, because we are going to read in the number of falling edges. Um, we're going to disable the alternate functions on port C. We just want to use it for a regular a general purpose input output pin. Um, this is going to be a digital pin. So analog mode select is disabled. Uh, we're going to so what this means is that we have to uh, enable, so digital enable. So this is a digital I.O. Uh, so, it, so analog mode disabled, uh, digital mode enabled, and uh, we're going to use this as a regular I.O. port pin. So the, uh, we're going to reset the corresponding bits in the PCTL register as uh, described several times before. So once the initialization is routine, we can now proceed to the configuration of the interrupts. So the first step is to um, uh, the, uh, enable the interrupts. So we can uh, we can start from here actually. So we, we are uh, enabling the fourth bit of the register, the 
uh, IM register that we are that contains the ARM bit and um, we are going to uh, then we can uh, a lot of th these things can be done in any arbitrary order but let's just start from here then uh, the interrupt sense uh, we're going to make it uh, we're going to make port C pin number four as the edge sensitive so we are going to clear the fourth bit of the interrupt sense register we're going to uh, we don't want the interrupt to be triggered on both edges so we are going to clear the fourth bit of interrupt both edge register and then uh, we want to make it a falling edge event so the IEV register uh, fourth bit uh, is also clear so falling edge when the fourth bit is cleared and then to start with we're going to clear the trigger flag on PC4 and remember we're going to clear it again in the ISR so we remember to clear we're going to clear the trigger over here in the very beginning to be on the safe side on the safe side and we're going to clear it again and we're going to clear it again in the ISR of port C and uh, this one has already been discussed so the arm bit has been set equals to 1 next we want to set priority levels to the port C pin number 4 interrupt we first need to figure out the priority register for the port C interrupt and from the table we can see that this is NVIC priority register number zero contain and the three bits are bit number 21 to 23 so we're going to write to these bits to set the priority but one of the things to note over here is that this table uh, skips a lot of the bits in the NVIC priority zero register and also for the other registers and writing to those bits just does not matter we can write anything for example we can write anything we can write anything to say bit number 16 to 20 without consequence we can write anything but we have to be careful here So we have to be careful about these three bits and we just don't care about uh, some of the bits which are not listed here for example 16 to 20. So keeping that in mind we are not going to write C code to configure the priority levels of the port C interrupt. So the first statement says that we're going to update the contents of the priority and priority register number zero by resetting bit number 16 uh, starting from bit number 16 the, so the first nibble over here the f zero corresponding to the first nibble here 16 to 19 and then this one is uh, 21 22 23 uh, so as we said before writing to bit number 16 to 19 uh, can be done without any consequence so it can be anything so we have cleared those bits which actually doesn't matter but we really do care about bit number 20 to 23 in fact we really care about bit number 21 to 23 so if i have bit number 23 22 21 and this one is what this instruction does is that it is going to write 10 a uh, to these four bits so when we write a hex a it means that i'm really writing one zero one zero but since the priority is determined only by three bits 23 22 and 21 as we saw before so that one that is actually 101 it is going to set priority number five so this is how you would like to so uh, you, you can actually make use of the fact that some of the bits if even if they are written two in this register they just doesn't matter but we but the bits which do matter must be written very carefully so this syntax does exactly that and finally we have to enable the bit in the NVIC enable register uh, so the port C uh, IRQ so remember uh, 
Um, the w w again referring back to the uh, NVIC enable table, uh, we note that um, the second bit, so the s second bit, actually starting from bit number, so, so uh, maybe I should say like this, so bit number two corresponds to the port C interrupt. So the bit number two corresponds to the port C interrupt. Therefore, uh, I set NVIC enable register equals to four. That is going to set this bit equals to one which means that we have enabled the interrupt two in the NVIC enable register. And um, initially, the falling edges are zero. So that is the edge counter. And we're going to enable the interrupts. Uh, the global interrupt, that is the prime mass register, bit I. Uh, this, so this routine will disable the bit I, meaning that uh, the bit I is set equals to zero. So the global interrupts are enabled the microprocessor can now acknowledge and process the interrupts. And finally, we are here. We are ready to write our first interrupt service routine. This is for the interrupt service routine uh, uh, for port C, um, who's, uh, who is configured for interrupt to be sensed on pin number four. The name of the routine is the same name as we find in the startup.s file that is going to remain unchanged so we, we, we don't want to change the name of the interrupt service routine uh, that is the same name uh, the, the the default interrupt service routine name that is the gpio port c handler we saw those names in the table as well uh, before uh, so we have seen that before so assuming that we're not going to change the name of the routine um, then the only thing that we need to do is to clear the trigger flag. Uh, that is the acknowledgement. So as I said before, that we would clear the trigger flag indirectly by writing to the clear register, interrupt clear register, ICR. Uh, and because this is the interrupt which is triggered by pin number four uh, voltage level, so, that's, so, so this one zero will clear the bit number four of the RAS register, so this is going to more comment. This is going to clear bit number four of the RAS register. And also, once the microprocessor enters this routine, we are going to update the global variable. So remember, this is the global variable. The falling edge counter is the global variable, and it has been incremented. Uh, that's it. And you would have guessed, maybe not. Um, the writing, this is your first interrupt service routine and it contains only two instructions, but two very important instruction. And um, writing an interrupt service routine is, is an important uh, part of your training as far as uh, the, uh, you know, writing the device drivers is concerned in which the interrupt service routine can actually be far more complicated than that. But this is a good beginning, in my opinion. What you're going to do now is that you're going to update the startup.s file and run the program, the main program, and whenever there is an interrupt uh, as the falling edge on port number C, pin number four, your microprocessor will execute this interrupt service routine. Let us now take an example of interfacing the keypad using the cystic timer interrupt. We shall consider a four row by four column keypad containing 16 keys. So we have 16 keys. These are arranged in a grid of four rows and four columns. Essentially, we have four row wires, row one, row two, all the way to row three, and four column wires. And there is, there are 16 switches. So 16 keys correspond to 16 switches. These are shown here by the switch symbols. What happens is that whenever 
a key is pressed, then the corresponding switch is closed. For instance, if we press 1, what this means is that we are uh, we are pressing this key. Therefore, this switch will be the switch correspond the, the switch which corresponds to key one is closed, which is going to short circuit row one wire with the column one. And so whatever voltage signal is at row zero will be uh, available at column zero. So the row zero and column zero are essentially short circuited. And another example would be if somebody if we press D key D uh, that means this switch is pressed and therefore and now in this case row 3 and column 3 wires are short-circuited therefore whatever voltage signal we have let's say high voltage signal or uh, actually we're going to use the low the same will be appeared on the column 3 wire now our job is to essentially scan this 4x4 keypad and to be able to determine which key has been pressed for further processing and we're going to interface this keypad keypad to our microcontroller the schematic diagram of a keypad interface to the microcontroller is shown here the column wires of the keypad are connected to port a whereas the row wires are connected to port d and as you can see that the port a, as indicated by these incoming arrows, suggests that the port A will be our input port. That is, we are going to read data. We are going to read in the port A data uh, to determine what key has been pressed. That is, essentially, we are going to read into the microcontroller the data supplied by the column wires of the keypad and there are four column wires each one is pulled up by external resistance which means that the default value on the port pins is going to be one or logic high whatever uh, is more appropriate to to understand um, port d is the uh, port d as indicated by these arrows appear to be supplying a signal to the row wires of the keypad and we're going to use port d essentially as an output port and later in our keypad scan strategy we are going to serially drive each port d pin to zero and then this zero wire uh, so, so the zero, the, the the wire which is driven by the zero or the low signal, um, will be used to determine if a key has been pressed by any. So, any if if, if there is any key connected to row number zero when it is at low, that is going to short circuit row zero with one of these columns. And therefore, if row zero is at voltage level low or zero and if one of these keys one two three or a is pressed then one of these columns will be driven to zero and I'm, I'm going to show you with the help of an example on the next few slides let us now try to understand how the keypad scan routine will work we are going to establish the logic of the program and it works by driving one of the port D pins as an output pin and set it to low voltage. On the other hand, the port A pins are always configured as the input pins. So if, for example, we wish to scan the keys available on row zero, then we know that there are four possible keys, one, two, three, and A. Therefore, if we want to determine if any one of these four keys is pressed, then we are going to drive PD0 to low voltage. And if, for example, the key 1 is pressed, then it is going to short circuit row 0 
wire with the column zero wire which which is going to bring the low voltage available at PA2 likewise if uh, for example uh, key A is pressed it is going to bring this zero over here that is PA5 would become equals to zero and we are going to systematically so once this row zero has been scanned in the next iteration we're going to scan row number one and here's an example so suppose uh, we are now scanning row number one and the key which was pressed key B was pressed then it is going to short circuit the column number short it is going to short circuit row 2 wire with the column 3 wire which is going to bring PA5 equals to 0 likewise if we are scanning third row uh, which is actually row number 2 driving it to 0 and key 8 is pressed it is going to bring 0 to PA3 and you can imagine if the key press was 7 just for the sake of another example it would have brought 0 over here that's when these two wires are short circuited this key 7 was over here and finally uh, when, when we're scanning the third row and hash was pressed again we can see that because this is the third key in this um, this is the third column or the column number two this is going to uh, input zero at PA4 after devising the keypad scan strategy our next problem is to determine the keypad scan interval which means that we want to determine how often should we scan the keypad to determine the keys which have been pressed in other words we want to calculate the interval between the successive scans and here we are going to make some assumptions the first of them being the constant typing speed and in this case we have taken an example of uh, 10 keys pressed per second and it would be helpful to visualize the keypad status as um, as sort of a function of a time and the status can be represented as a two level signal one level describing some key pressed which is to say one of these levels on the waveform essentially this is a two level waveform um, and this sort of high level uh, you can say corresponds to the keypad status saying that some key has been pressed the low level may correspond to a switch status or the keypad status where no key has been pressed and an idle key press sequence would go like this a key and then the silent interval then the next key press and then another silent interval and then the next key press and so on and this is consistent with the waveform that we have drawn here now in an ideal world it would have been a perfect square wave but the one shown over here represents a more real life situation and that's because whenever a switch is pressed and because the switch is a mechanical device it tends to oscillate before settling to a stable signal so therefore these oscillation these are essentially representing the switch bounce or debounce situation now in order to determine the keypad the appropriate keypad scan interval we are going to consider the two time intervals the switch bounce or debounce time which is the time taken by the switch to settle to some uh, to uh, so, so, so it is the time taken by a by the switch uh, uh, time taken by the switch to finish its oscillation but although uh, the oscillations do not disappear completely beyond this point there are still some oscillation but by the time the amplitude of the oscillation uh, 
has been reduced to an extent that we can consider this to be uh, insignificant. The switch debounce time is one metric. The other time is the key press time. That is the time for which the key remains pressed. And you can see that this is half the time of one time period of the typing sequence. So uh, here we are assuming the 50% duty cycle. That is the key remain pressed for half the time of the entire keypad. Uh, uh, so, so, so the key remains pressed for half of the time uh, of one cycle of the typing. Now, uh, given these two times, the key press times and the switch bounce time, we can make some observation. For example, uh, it is useless to, scan, to keep this keypad scan interval, which is smaller than the switch bounce time, because that is uh, when, because we don't want to scan the keypad uh, while the switch is bouncing or debouncing. And so, so this actually sets the lower limit. So switch bounce time is the lower limit. And the key press time uh, defines the upper limit of the keypad scan interval. So it means that we, uh, our keypad scan interval must not exceed, it must be, uh, it must be less than it must be less than the upper limit that is the key press time because if it is not less than then we it, it is possible that we miss uh, some of the keys which are pressed along the way so here's the rule the switch bounce time so the key path scan interval should be higher than the switch bounce time that is a lower bound but it must be less than the key press time and if we select the keypad scan interval appropriately, we can identify uh, a situation where the typing uh, deviates from the ideal creep press sequence, such as uh, the problem of a two key rollover. So in, in a two key rollover problem, uh, if a key is pressed, then the next key is pressed before the previous key is released. So the user may type A and then press B immediately while the A is still pressed and then B. So this none, uh, this silent interval may disappear. So this is a two key rollover problem where we have two keys which are simultaneously pressed. And we're going to devise the keypad scan strategy where we can actually determine a situation like this where the two keys are pressed simultaneously and what this uh, what, what these limits guarantee us is that the with the help of this uh, so, so with the help of an appropriately chosen keypad scan interval which satisfies these two constraints we can actually uh, identify we can actually catch the two key rollover situation and then discard um, the, 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 the scan which actually has captured two keys simultaneously pressed because that uh, is not what we, then that doesn't really convey the correct uh, information about the key pressed. So keep in mind, key press scan interval must be less than the key press time and higher than the switch bounce time. In practice, uh, this is what about 10 milliseconds and uh, given the 10 keys per second uh, the key press time is half of 100 uh, it is actually going to be half of 100 milliseconds which is 50 milliseconds so it has to be somewhere between 50 and 10 milliseconds and the value chosen in the program is going to be 25 milliseconds all right, it is now time to write the C program. The, our first step, uh, the first task is to initialize the port and we have a routine over here. We're going to activate the clock for port A and D and we're going to wait for some time before 
the clock stabilizes and then we are going to configure first port A. So we're going to configure port A as the digital uh, input port. Uh, so there is, so it is, we are going to disable the analog mode. There is no alternate function. And the PCTL also says that this is a GPIO port and it is digitally enabled. Uh, and it is going to be the input port. So the direction register is going to reset the corresponding bits. In this case, we're going to make port A pin five uh, pin 2, 3, 4, and 5 as the input. And we are going to leave the other pins direction unchanged. That's why we're going to use this uh, uh, clear, bit specific clear instruction. Then comes the configuration of port D. Again, uh, digital uh, GPIO uh, and no alternate function. The port D. Uh, although it's going to be used, one of the pins on the port D is going to be used as an output port, but the remaining pins, we never said anything about them. And it turns out that it makes more sense to make port D as the input port as default. So the default, by default, we're going to make port D as the input port in the beginning. And whatever pin, that needs to be driven to zero whenever we are going to scan the corresponding row that is made at the as an output pin when the program is run so in the beginning even port d is made as the input port one of the port pins will be made as an output port pin but that will be done during the execution of the program and one advantage of this technique is that uh, the other three port pins which uh, are not meant to be driven are at high impedance that's what it does so initially all the port D pins are at high impedance um, port D is digitally is a digital GPIO uh, and uh, that's the input pin as we uh, yeah so here we said as an input pin and uh, there is some uh, depending upon uh, the current requirement here in this example we have set 8 milliamps drive current next task is to define an appropriate data structure to enable the key scan and in this case we have a struct called a row which has two variables the direction and the key code variable which is an array in fact an array containing four characters so key ca key code array contains four ca character and the direction variable is a byte unsigned byte variable and we're going to define a constant struct row of type row type so this row type uh, is going to be a uh, is a data structure of type row but and it has been declared as constant so that's type defined and whatever instant instantiation is, is going to take place regarding this row struct, it is now going to happen with the type defined row type. So we're going to essentially instantiate five objects of row or row type, and within each uh, within each row struct. Um, we have a direction and the key code and uh, uh, th this key code uh, information is fairly straightforward so remember here we have five rows row 0 1 2 3 and there is a last row we, can, we may want to call it row number four and we can see that row 0 contains uh, these 1 2 3 a keys so these are uh, again consistent with the schematics of the keypad and the last row is actually a null row it doesn't contain any key and the question is what does the first element tell us the first variable the direction so these are all direction what does it actually tell us well hex 01 let's take an example of hex 01 so this is 0000 0001 and later in the program we, we are going to show that the lower nibble of 
this value that is the least significant four bits are going to be are going to be driving our port D in a way that the zero is going to set the corresponding port pin as an input pin so this is going to be port D uh, pin number three pin number two pin number one and pin number zero so wherever we have zero uh, that is going to be the input port D pin and and whatever and because there are no pull up resistance no pull down resistance connected to port D so whenever we make port D pin as an input pin it is going to be the high impedance pin it is going to be high impedance that's essentially disconnected and wherever we have a zero on port D uh, that is going to drive the pin the corresponding pin uh, so in this case this is going to be the input pin uh, sorry the output pin so one is going to make the corresponding pin of port D as the output pin and here we are going to set this output pin to zero and as you can see that hex 01 is going to drive port D pin number zero to zero that is when we are going to scan row number zero hex 02 is going to make port D pin number one as the output pin and all other pins are the, going to be, be the input pins at the high impedance and it corresponds to scanning row number one hex 04 corresponds to port D pin number two being made as an output pin and uh, it is driven to zero voltage and that's when we scan row 3 and this hex 08 corresponds to making port D pin number 3 as the output pin and that occurs when we are going to scan row number 3 so these numbers will be used later to configure the pins of port D and that is dictated by what row are we going to scan quite naturally if we, if we go top down we are going to scan row 0 row 1 row 2 row 3 and this defines the null row so now we have a matrix keypad scan routine we're going to work with a pointer to the row type and we're going to increment this pointer inside this routine we have some helping variable column character key we have variable j and we have another variable a pointer to the counter initialized to zero so essentially uh, this is also the input the input to this routine is a pointer to a 32-bit number and uh, that number has been initialized to zero so this instruction really says that um, we are going to dereference that pointer and so we are going to go to the ad memory address pointed to by the number and we go there and set the value equals to zero then we have the key variable uh, which registers the number of keys pressed and it is specifically useful to determine to be able to catch the two key rollover problem so we, we are going to count uh, during the keypad scan how many keys has been pressed so this is essentially a key counter initially set equals to zero and when we're going, going to set the initial value for, of, of our pointer to the scan table zero so remember in the previous slide uh, we looked at the scan table array it is uh, an array containing the four objects of type row and we're going to we are going to make sure that initially the pointer points to the first object that actually corresponds to row number zero and that's where we begin our scan so we're going to begin our scan from row number zero and later on we are going to increment this pointer such as pointer plus plus which will make our program to scan row number one and then row number two row number three until we, we reach the null row 
So this is how this program is going to work. But let's say we are now in our first iteration and we're going to sort of do the dry run to understand how this routine will work. Okay, there is a while loop inside this routine. And as long as the pointer referencing the direction, so as long as the direction value is not equals to zero, remember the null row situation. So as long as the value is not equal to zero, uh, this while loop will be executed. Now initially, pointer referencing the direction is going to give us hex zero one. That's when we are going to scan row number zero. So this while loop will execute because uh, in its argument, it, we have a non-zero number. Then our first uh, step is to determine the, as we said before, the port D direction. How do we determine the direction of port D? And in, in the very first iteration, we want to make PD0 as an output port, output port pin, and all three others are the input. Because we are really not interested in scanning row, these rows, so we are only interested in scanning row number zero. And that's what we're doing over here. So we are setting the GPIO port direction register in a way that uh, the direction information in the first iteration make this row as an output port and all other are made as the input port pins. And then we are going to send data to port D such that the pin which has been set as an output will be set equals to zero over here. So the pin which has been um, set as an output pin will be set equals to zero as a consequence of this instruction. <clears throat> and then, uh, so and this is, so this corresponds to sending zero to row number zero. Uh, and once the signal has been activated on port D, we are going to wait for some time. It's a, it's a very short delay, just 10 uh, iteration doing nothing. So there's a, a semicolon after this for loop. Uh, and we're, uh, th this uh, delay ensures that the signal generated on port D, um, and if there is some key which is pressed, if there is some key, one, two, three, or eight, if one of these keys is pressed, then we have a signal uh, route to one of the pins on port A, zero, one, uh, oh, well, actually there was uh, two, three, four, or five. So signal needs some time to travel from PD zero to one of those port A pins. That's why this delay is over here. Once the row signal has been activated and we have waited uh, for s some time before the signal reaches uh, one of the column wires, assuming some key was pressed, then we are going. We are now ready to read the column information, and this is an important thing to understand in the context of this program. We're going to read the GPIO port A data register. We're going to take a bitwise end with hex 3C. So what is hex 3C? Well, uh, this is actually 0011. Uh, and one one zero zero so this is c and this is three so hex three c what this means is that when we take a bitwise end of port a data with hex three c we are really interested in retaining data of port a pin number two three four and five and we really are setting the data on other pins uh, data available on the other pins equals to zero. So only this data, and in, in other words, we can just say B2, B3, bit number four, and, oh, sorry. So bit number four and bit number five. So only these bits are, are going to be retained and all other pins and uh, corresponding bits are set equals to zero. And here's the situation now. 
and then after taking the bitwise end we're going to shift right by two units which is going to push these four bits to the right by two units and as a result of this instruction we're going to have the information of uh, bit number two over here bit number three and bit number four and bit number five and all other bits are zero so as a result of this instruction we have here and b2 corresponds to the data originally available at pin number two b3 means data available at pin number three b4 data available at pin number uh, pa4 and bit 5 means data available at pa5 now the what is the purpose of this shifting let's now try to understand we're going to check uh, each one of these bits uh, sequentially in a way that uh, first we're going to test bit 2 if whether it is 0 or 1 and therefore we are going to take an end of the column so this this information this 8 bit information is in the variable column so the variable column 8 bit information is very important and we are going to test its least significant bit right so we're going to test its least significant bit and once the bit has been tested we're going to further shift this information to the right so that in the first iteration bit 2 is tested in the next iteration we have b3 over here b4 b5 and 0 0 0 0 0 and then we're going to test now b3 would become the least significant bit in the next iteration and afterwards if we go one step further the next time b4 will be the least significant bit b5 will be the least significant bit and we have zeros elsewhere and all of that occurs when we shift the column right by one unit that all of that occurs within this for loop uh, within this while loop actually so this column shifting right within this while loop uh, so remember there was a while loop over here in the previous slide so this column uh, is in uh, the column shifting right is in the while loop uh, oh well it is in the it is in the for loop sorry about that it is in the for loop yes yes so the column shifting right it is in the for loop okay so wh what is the purpose so wh what is the whole idea of shifting the bits right in the column variable well let's take a look at an example to better understand what's going on so in this example suppose that uh, key d was pressed and uh, at some point the row 3 was being scanned uh, what this means is that pointer uh, the direction variable has a value hex 08 and you can consult the struct uh, row for more details then we need to dry run this for loop over here so this for loop iterates over the variable j which runs from 0 to 3 so if key d was pressed and row 3 was scanned then the direction value is hex 08 in this case the column has a value five zeros and three ones and in the and in the first iteration the if condition over here returns false because the least significant bit is not equal to zero so remember this if condition is true whenever the least significant bit is zero here it is one so this false uh, and if it had been true then we would have determined we could have deduced that the key static was pressed then in the next iteration j increases to 1 and we shift right so this is by shifting the column right uh, 
now we have we still have one at the least significant bit if condition remain false j is equal to 2 still the least significant bit is 1 this false this if condition remains false but finally at the fourth iteration when j is equal to 3 the condition becomes true and that is going to tell us that the key d was pressed right and that's because key code 3 is equal to value character d when uh, how, how do we determine that's because the direction is hex 8 direction is hex 8 so if we look at the struct row when the direction is hex 8 when the pointer gives the direction value hex 8 0 8 then uh, when the pointer the same pointer reference key code 3 that is j equals to 3 when this condition is true then the value is d and that's how we determine the d was pressed and then the pointer has been incremented and what do we mean by incrementing the pointer so for example the pointer was pointing to the third element of the array that that is when we were scanning row number three that's that's where i said that key code index three gives you d the pointer is over here and then the pointer is incremented it means that it is now going to point to this null row and then the while loop is going to end when pointer direction is zero when the pointer direction is hex zero zero if that occurs then the while loop ends and the routine is going to return the value of the key now an important thing to understand is that uh, the scan the nice thing about this for do when this key path scans routine is that whenever the when, so we scan the column carefully all of its four bits one by one and the number of zeros in the column number of zeros um, that is the number uh, so the number of bits on port a uh, corresponds to the number of keys pressed so if for example uh, port a 2 to 5 has two zeros are read then this num uh, would correspond so this num would be equals to 2 so we can actually count how many zeros have we read in from port a that data that information enters the column and then we can increment our counter so at the end of the day we return the value of key that we have scanned the last value of the key that has been scanned but what we also get is the number of keys pressed so this was the input remember this was the input argument and it is updated so input has been updated and this is can this can also be um, um, th this information about the key press can be inferred by referring to this uh, uh, num uh, num pointer which was the input argument to this routine so we, we got we are actually obtaining two pieces of information the key and the number of keys pressed the last key and the number of keys pressed because there can, can be number more than one keys pressed during uh, a keypad scan now in order to enable a periodic keypad scan we need to synchronize it with the help of periodic interrupts in this case the periodic interrupt will be generated by the cystic timer so we are going to load the cystic timer with some appropriate values so that whenever it finishes its countdown it generates an interrupt and whenever the interrupt is generated we execute the cystic timer isr and in which we can initiate the keypad scan we can execute the keypad scan so well, one of the things to do over here is that we're going to write the isr interrupt service routine of the cystic timer uh, that is going to call the keypad scan so we are going to 
call the keypad scan routine inside the interrupt service routine. And as we learn in the beginning of this lecture, that for each source of interrupt, we have to have an arm bit set. And then the trigger flag uh, needs to be uh, need, needs to be handled carefully. Although in this case, uh, in the case of cystic timer, the the trigger flag uh, after being set by the hardware is automatically cleared in the software the moment we enter ISR. We don't have to explicitly clear the trigger flag in case of cystic timer interrupt service routine. We also need to set the interrupt priority and uh, for that if you consult the table this is the in NVIC priority register number 3 bit 29 30 and 31 those three bits are going to set the cystic timer interrupt priority we should also um, enable the global interrupt that is the global on off switch we're going to set this i bit equals to zero in the prime s register uh, and we're, we're going to do that indirectly um, uh, by you by calling this interrupt uh, uh, enable interrupt routine and what about the base priority register by default base pre is set equals to zero mean meaning that uh, regardless of the priority uh, we are going to uh, uh, enable we are going to accept the microprocessor uh, is going to accept the interrupt uh, the cystic timer interrupt in this case and here is a routine for configuring the cystic timer interrupt cystic timer initiate uh, it accepts a 32-bit number unsigned number and that number is going to determine the um, the keypad scan interval and so for example uh, if uh, so so, it, so so this period has a units of bus clock 12.5 nanoseconds or 20 milliseconds um, so therefore we're going to set this period carefully depending upon the keypad scan interval as we saw in the previous uh, in our previous discussion on the timer routines the first thing to do is to disable the cystic timer control register uh, we are going to uh, reload the timer with the period so this uh, is the same as the keypad scan interval and uh, this number corresponds to this keypad scan interval and then um, we can write anything to the current register but then the priority we have to set the priority we have to assign some priority in this case priority 2 so bit number 29 30 and 31 and finally we have the control register uh, bits initially which were made zero because we were configuring the timer now once the configuration is complete we want to enable the timer we want to enable three things so we want to start the timer that is the enable and we want to enable the clock so remember this was bit number zero this was bit number two we have seen that uh, in our previous lecture but then the bit number one is the arm bit that is that must be said if we want to enable the timer interrupt so the arm bit often mentioned as the interrupt enable is bit number one all these three bits must be set now and then therefore the control register value is set equals to seven essentially clearing the count flag which is bit number six and once that is done now all we need to do is to enable the global interrupt so this keypad uh, sorry so this cystic timer initialization routine needs to be executed uh, so as to ensure that the keypad scan interval is synchronized properly with the cystic timer interrupt so each time 
the cystic timer counts completes its countdown uh, its interrupt service routine will be activated or executed its interrupt service routine will be executed by the microcontroller and now our last step is to write the interrupt service routine of the cystic timer interrupt wherein we are going to write uh, we are going to invoke the keypad scan routine so before I write the interrupt service routine um, it is important to understand how to call the cystic initialization uh, to enable a, a keypad scan interval of 25 milliseconds so this time period so how, what should be the input argument so over here we have 2 million which is a result of 25 millisecond divided by the 80 megahertz clock time period which is 12.5 nanosecond and that is going to give you 2 into 10 to the power 6 because this uh, milli is going to cancel with nano and we have 10 to the power 6 in the numerator that's 2 so that assumes 80 megahertz clock again if the clock changes then we have to adjust this value accordingly so with that in mind we put this number 2 into 10 to the power 6 as an input argument and uh, when, when that happens and we execute this cystic initialization routine then after each millisecond we are uh, the interrupt is generated so uh, what this means is that the cystic interrupts every 25 milliseconds in other words we're going to the cystic timer will interrupt the microprocessor of every 25 milliseconds and when that happens we are going to so microprocessor executes so when that happens the microprocessor executes its ISR the ISR of cystic timer which is what we are going to dis discuss in the next slide and here uh, essentially this routine the matrix initialization routine initializes uh, some variables such as the, um, uh, the the last key we will see why this is required it initializes the timer and there are, are some formulations some uh, built-in libraries uh, which are used here may not be very useful you will have to write these by yourself uh, or implement these by yourself depending upon your project but the main thing over here is the initialization uh, routine and the matrix keypad initiation has also been discussed so we are going to initialize the ports and we are going to initialize so so here we are uh, th th this one is the initialization of the ports and the initialization of the timer and the timer is armed with the interrupt so finally we are now ready to write our cystic timer interrupt service routine the name of the routine is going to be the same name as in the interrupt vector table uh, described earlier in the lecture the cystic underscore handler and in this routine we are going to do the keypad scan so the main so we are going to call the key matrix keypad scan routine and we're going to input n where n is the key counter n is the key counter so remember we are extracting two pieces of information from the matrix keypad routine one of them how many keys pressed this one and what is the last key pressed because there can be multiple keys pressed uh, under certain circumstances there can be multiple keys pressed and therefore scanned in one uh, in, in in a single keypad scan so assuming that the trimer interrupt has been acknowledged and we don't need to explicitly clear the trigger flag we just uh, uh, write the code we just want microprocessor to execute our main code over here which is to do the keypad scan and then the next part inside this routine we're going to check for the two key rollover 
essentially, uh, if we momentarily forget about this instruction, what we require is that the last registered key must not must be different from the new key, right? So it is possible that the last key uh, is a null key, which is fine, uh, because we may have a sequence, a key press, and then there is none, right? So these uh, again, this is different. So A is different from the none key. So the last key must be different from the current key that is scanned currently. And then the number of key pressed should be equals to one. If these two conditions are fulfilled, then the key path scan output is registered and we are going to update the last key. Last key is set equals to this key. And if these conditions are not pressed, then uh, we consider the key pad scan routine output as invalid and in that case we can just register a none key over here in other words we can just say it's not no no key pressed so this zero really corresponds to this none uh, situation so that's it uh, we have so with the help of a cystic timer in trap service routine and the condition that there must be only single key pressed and if there was a situation like A, B, the two key press, then this condition would be false. And uh, we declared that an invalid key. So that's all about the keypad scan synchronized with the interrupt, cystic timer of interrupt. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude our lecture number seven. I hope you enjoyed listening to this lecture. And if you have questions, just drop me an email or ask CR to schedule a Q&A session. Till next time, take care and goodbye.